Hello and welcome to episode six of the One Stop English podcast. Each month we bring together teachers, editors and experts to discuss what's going on in the world of ELT. I'm your host, Sam Wadsworth, former teacher and current editor here at Macmillan. Joining me this month are Patrick Curry, Delta qualified teacher and editor on One Stop English. Hello, Sam. Becca Sanderson, former teacher and editor of numerous business and general English titles. Hey, Sam. And Skyping in from Brazil, Natalia Guerrero, teacher, trainer and examiner of aviation English for the Brazilian Air Force. Hello, hello all. On this month's show, we'll be discussing videos in the flip classroom, the most annoying word in America, special interest groups and contrastive analysis. We also have an interview with Adrian Underhill, creator of the Sound Foundation's phonemic chart and founder of the IATEFL Teacher Development Special Interest Group. So, Natalia, thanks for getting up so early to join us. How are you feeling today? I'm great. How are you? I'm not too bad. You're not too bad. So I thought before we got started, we should talk to you a little bit more about your job, Brie, really, because it's quite interesting. So how did you get into aviation English? Well, civil servants in Brazil are selected through an exam, and I did this exam to, jo to join the Air Force, passed, and at first I didn't even know what air traffic controllers <laughs> uh, did. Uh, so it was quite a learning curve, I, yeah, uh, but it was great learning from them uh, what they do and having aviation safety as the ultimate goal of, every, of everything I do. Right, yeah. And I think you were saying earlier when we were chatting before uh, recording that you don't actually teach the standard grammar points. Some of them you don't teach because they don't use them. Yes, like um, the second conditional or especially the third conditional, they're, they're not very common in pilot controller conversations because they're very bound by the there and then. Yes. Um, right. So uh, some grammar is different and they also are restricted by phraseology so every phraseology is a set of of sentences that everybody memorizes around the world so pilots and controllers are sure they mean the same thing by the same words right yeah and and when the phraseology is not enough they rely on their knowledge of general english of aviation english actually and that's what we teach them we teach the that that kind of english that should be phraseology like right yeah well thank you so much for coming on the show thank you for inviting me it's an honor you're welcome Okay, let's get started. Um, Becca, you're going to tell us why the modern teacher needs a professional online presence. Yes. First question for everyone. What do PewDiePie, Stampy Longnose, Nerdy Nummies and Dan TDM all have in common? I actually know this because I am a bit of a video game nerd mm. and the first name on that list is a very, very big YouTuber. Yes. Um, he is a video game YouTuber. Yeah. Have so you they're all vloggers, are they? They are all YouTube sensations. Have you heard of any of them, Natalia? No, they all sound like... Very interesting names. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they all uh, are YouTube sensations. So whether it be lifestyle, gaming or cooking or sport, these folk are all over YouTube with millions of people subscribing to their channels. Uh, but now there is a new wave of ELT vloggers who have come to join the party. Uh, loads of short, slick, creative videos with enthusiastic and entertaining teachers who really seem to engage with their growing number of subscribers. Yeah, this is definitely a thing. Yeah. Did so you know it was a thing? Not really. I mean, uh, I think there was a recent article about it on uh, ELT Jam. Yeah, that's what turned me on to it. So, yeah, a really nice post earlier this year by teacher and online content creator Tom Reese. And so he talks about the rise of these TEFL tubers and recommends a few. So I thought I'd check them out and report back to you, the One Stop Collective. So uh, let's start with Tom Reese. His channel is called Eat, Sleep, Dream English. And I got in touch with Tom and he told me he started posting videos about a year ago. And he's got a really nice mix on his channel. So there's pronunciation videos. Uh, he looks at slang. There's songs. Uh, there's situational or survival English like ordering coffee in Starbucks. And then there's lots of really wonderfully random ones. For example, one of my favourites is how to say seven famous British names perfectly. Uh, another vlogger I got in touch with was John and his channel is called Cork English Teacher and he specialises in short, punchy 
prawn videos. In fact, he says uh, he has yet to make a video longer than 60 seconds. Perhaps that's the key. Wow. And he says people use social media for fun. So by making shorter clips, he can really grab their attention and encourage them to interact a bit more. And I think interaction is quite an interesting point with mm. these videos. So how do you think these YouTubers are able to interact with the people watching? Do, do they, uh, are there kind of the comment sections below the videos? Is they, yeah. Do the people leave comments and they reply to the people who leave comments? Yeah, yeah. John from Cork English Teacher, that's exactly what he does, uses the comments. Anything else? I mean, it's quite common for any social media outlet to have Q&A sections. So often um, people would submit questions either via the comments mm -hmm. or via an email or something like that. And then they would make a video answering those questions directly. I see. Yeah. That's quite common. So sort of, a, a sort of general feedback to the previous video. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a very common way to do things. People even put in requests for future videos. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of interaction that way. So a, a real community seems to build up in some of the prawn videos that uh, Tom does. He, you know, he leaves a pause in which the students can okay. say what they so need to say. So he sort of simulates CCQs and yeah. ICQs and that kind yeah. of thing. Okay. Yeah, so I think there's there's ways, there's workarounds for the, to create that kind of classroom dynamic, which of course is something that's missing in this medium. The vloggers themselves create a sense of community, which is really nice. Um, there's another channel called English with Lucy. And actually, of all the vloggers I saw, I think Lucy has the largest number of subscribers, about 300,000 at the moment, which wow. is kind of a drop in the water compared to someone like PewDiePie, which which is like right. 50 million. But I think for sort of an industry specific yeah. video, that's not bad. Yeah. But yeah, she often has other vloggers on her show, on her videos. So it creates that sense of community, which is really nice. I think there's a lot of positives here for this kind of uh, resource. John was saying that, you know, they're free. He says also that he's received lots of messages from people around the world explaining, you know, how they can't afford to pay for classes. So um, online resources are really helpful. Yeah. But we should play devil's advocate. Do you think there's any negatives, any downsides to using or making this kind of resource, I Sam? Mean, the obvious one to me is the lack of interaction with students. Mm. I think that definitely when you're doing any kind of, uh, you know, classroom teaching, that kind of exchange is really, really important. So, you know, mm. eliciting things from students, eliciting answers from them, checking that they understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. getting that instant feedback and helping them instantly is such a big part of it. So I think you really need to rethink how you use that medium, what it's best for and how it works best. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I think also it's quite subjective as well because you choose, well, as the uh, YouTuber, you choose what your what content you're going to present. Yes, um, and then also from the viewer's point of view as well, I, I've actually seen Lucy and uh, she's kind of young and quite lively. But some people maybe who'd like a more serious approach wouldn't mm. be that keen on, on her kind of style. Um, Natalia, have you seen any of these people? I think I have. Uh, but uh, uh, the ones I know the, uh, the best are Brazilian YouTubers. It's, it's quite a trend in Brazil. Is it? And, yeah, and they use Portuguese to teach English. Yeah. Uh, they focus on, on the mistakes Brazilians uh, make. Yeah, that's another mm. angle, isn't it? There's a there's a lady who does the same in Japanese and English. Ch right, okay. Chika, I think her name is, but she's I think she seems to be one of the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. So perhaps this angle is uh, is the most successful. Yeah. Yeah, Karina Fragoso would be a big name in, Braz in Brazil. Oh, okay, yeah, I have heard of her, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I think also, yeah, like similar to what you're saying, Patrick, there's no quality control necessarily with some of these things um, so you're really relying on that teacher knowing what they're talking about and hoping the student can understand what's what's you know differentiate what's good and what's not so good right and actually something I just thought of I suppose unlike a classroom if you have a, a class regularly every day then you can personalize content personalized delivery to them mm -hmm which you can't if you have, you know, 700,000 subscribers or, mm -hmm. or something. You just have to do what, I guess, you think will interest most people. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. That leads to the next point. How do you think these videos in the classroom can kind of engage with each other? Is there a way for a teacher in a class to incorporate these videos? Well, I think the most obvious one would probably be the flipped classroom element, which I think we've touched upon a couple of times in previous yes. pods. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, setting students something to watch before the class so then you wouldn't have to spend a huge amount of time in class explaining mm -hmm. a particular grammar point because they'd already seen that. That would be the, the, the most obvious one, I'd say. Natalia, is that um, something that Brazilian YouTubers do, do you think? I think that's definitely uh, a trend in, that we, we're picking up on now. Uh, just just this week, there was an example. A teacher in the community I help moderate, a uh, community for Brazilian English language teachers, 
belt, it's called. Uh, uh, this teacher reported a specific difficulty from a single student with the pronunciation of the R sound, mm -hmm. like in words like in the uh, round. So to help the student see the articulation of this sound, I recommended a YouTube video by Rachel's English. Okay. And, and she superimposed a diagram of the mouth over her video making the sound, so okay. that could be quite helpful. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you don't have to do that for everybody if, it, if not everybody has that problem. So do you guys think that we could actually take this a step further and perhaps teachers could, they could make these instructional videos so they're like an interactive version of that kind of grammar reference box you get at the back of books. Yeah. And that could be, actually be part, they build it into their lesson plans. So in class you say, okay, go home and watch my video, my instructional mm -hmm. video about this grammar point, do these uh, consolidation activities and then when you come to class... We're going to talk about it. I, I would say that's the ideal. I think that's a brilliant idea, but um, perhaps not so practical. A lot of the teachers, you know, as we know, you get an hourly rate. You've got a finite amount of time for preparation. Right. So it, I don't know. The logistics of this right. is yeah. it's a, di a whole different conversation, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots to think about and lots will be happening because, you know, the subscribers will keep going up and these things are going to get bigger and bigger from what I can tell. But yeah, we'll put the links up on our um, notes and also for that Eltjam article as well. So everyone, the listeners can uh, have a look. If you like what you see, you could possibly integrate things into your lessons or recommend them to your students or maybe even start your own channel and become a TEFL tuber yourself. If you do, let us know and we'll check it out. All right, thanks, Becca. Patrick, I understand that Americans have a huge problem with indifference. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a kind of a light-hearted second story we looked at. So uh, basically at Pod HQ, we like to, to keep up with word news. And a recent story caught our eye during the last month, which was a poll of Americans aged over 18, uh, revealed that for the eighth year running, the most hated word in the English language is whatever what really <laughs> really didn't like it and i think the dislike of it seems to stem from the fact that it's really really dismissive mm. just shows a complete lack of interest in whatever it. <laughs> well it annoyed 38 percent of people surveyed it was their number one most hated <laughs> word uh. um it's only the it's only annoying in its usage as one word response when it expresses boredom or, or disinterest so it's right. not if it's a pronoun or adjective then no one gets annoyed by it but yeah, this got me thinking about how much influence uh, a teacher's likes and dislikes of words should have over what they teach, mm -hmm. what vocabulary, what phrases they teach. So just before I want to want to get into the discussion, um, Natalia, are there any words that you really hate and you wouldn't teach? I wouldn't say I wouldn't teach it, mm. but I don't like the word academic when used as um, to mean it's not relevant. Right. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's it's, it's academic. It's not worth talking yeah. about. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sam, any any pet peeves? Yeah, a few. I would say that um, it a depends few. on something. At low level, um, can be quite frustrating. I think for the learners as well, because they they often can't actually explain the conditions that something depends on. And if you're asking them about something, you know, that is just sort of a simple binary choice, and it's just to help them practice the language, like, do you prefer tea or coffee? Do you prefer sushi or pizza? Often the response you get would be, it depends. And then they're unable to explain the conditions that it depends on, which, mm -hmm. which can be frustrating for everyone. Um, I also find uh, the, the word like in a particular American English used as punctuation, very annoying. You know, when people say like, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something on a podcast like, and it's really like used as like, I don't know, punctuation. Mm hmm. I think that would be annoying, but that's annoying for native speakers as well. I'd try right, and stamp absolutely. that out of them. Becca? Uh, yeah, like was definitely on my list, and I know I do it myself, and uh, it makes it even more annoying somehow. Another one which I think is my, maybe just my own personal thing is that is saying right at the end of a sentence when you don't really need to say right at the end of the sentence. I wonder if that's a bit more of an American thing, so maybe that's why I think it sounds a bit strange in British English, but I, I do think that might just be a just me sort of thing. <laughs> okay. And so, but, but that's a good question, you know, because it's just a me sort of thing, um, you know, is it my right to remove that mm. from the classroom mm. and tell people not to do that's, it? That's, that's the question. Should we, mm. how much influence should teachers have over the language they teach? I don't know if it's necessarily our role. Our role is to help them communicate, and if that's the way that they want to express them, 
themselves, I think that we should be helping them do that. I don't think it's you know necessarily our right, if you like, to yeah. stop them doing that. We can make them aware of what they're doing. For example, like, you're using like as punctuation. We mm. wouldn't necessarily do that. I think because sometimes people just fall into the habits of doing these, these sort of verbal tics. Natalia, what do you think? I think we should also help them be aware of the different connotations of the word. I was talking about it with a friend and her husband, who is an engineer, uh, went to the U.S. and the cashier asked, paper or plastic? Mm -hmm. And he said, whatever. And this is a 40-year-old uh, PhD, a, a doctor, saying, whatever. And the cashier didn't like it and it started mumbling, whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and he said, uh, and then he was very worried, is, is it wrong to say whatever? <laughs> he should be aware that people will see it negatively. Because right. in that context, it sounds all right to me to say whatever or whichever, either thing is okay. Yeah. But I think it's the dismissive tone that's the thing that okay, so, people yeah. react negatively to. Yeah, absolutely. But I think you're very uh, you're, you're absolutely right about connotations because mm. certain students are not aware of the connotations of various words, so mm -hmm. it's important to say that. But I think I agree with Sam that you shouldn't dictate what they can and can't learn based on your likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. um, just to round this off, there's some other words in the list I thought you might like to know. Mm -hmm. The word chillax. Oh, I quite like that. Deeply <laughs> unpopular. Um, oh. Uh, also, another noun, staycation, a blended noun, so uh, staying, oh, at, staying at home vacation. Yeah, yeah. Two more phrases. Uh, one of them was, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Very annoying. And also, at the end of the day. Oh, right. People, Classic people sort of didn't footballers like that either. Um, mm -hmm. two, more, two more briefly. Uh, as, as nominated by producer Rachel, the word moist. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. That's a much hated word, isn't it's it? It's very uh, wet sounding. Even, even uh. when referring to cakes, apparently. Yeah, uh, the and, word. And, and finally, my personal bugbear is this one, is uh, people who say, who, who prefix sentences with, to be honest. Oh, I'm guilty of that. As if they were going to be dishonest. Yeah. yeah. So, to be honest, I think we should round this off and move on. Well, Whatever. at the end of the day, I think you're right. <laughs> So, listeners, what are your thoughts? Do you have a professional YouTube account? Are any words or phrases banned in your classroom? Email your comments to one stop podcast at springernature.com. Okay, next up, we've got Warmer of the Month. Each month, we challenge our guest teacher to explain a fun communicative activity in no more than five steps. So, Natalia. What have you got for us? Well, it's not your typical warmer because it takes longer, but okay. I can explain it in five steps, promise. First, you collect 10 to 15 sentences that your students have said recently, like that week, uh, both good uses of language and, or sentences with one mistake. Okay. Then you tell your students that you're going to play an auction game and you'll probably need to pre-teach the word auction. You can imitate an auctioneer or show a picture of an auction hammer, mm -hmm. yep. or even do a dry run, showing them how to raise the, their hands for uh, to bid a hundred dollars or pounds. <laughs> um, and but you won't be selling vases, antiques, or paintings. You'll be selling these sentences. Mm -hmm. The third step: you separate them in groups and give them time to go over those sentences and negotiate if they're right or wrong, and if they're wrong, if they can fix it. Uh, the fourth step is the actual auction. You conduct an auction uh, with, for example, the first sentence could be, have a car at the end of the road. Let's say your Brazilian student said it. It's a very common Brazilian mistake. Have a car at the end of the road instead of there is, and you'll sell it, and you could sell it like this. Well, who wants sentence number one? Sentence number one is a short and sweet sentence about a car. Who wants sentence number one? Who wants sentence number one? Oh, oh okay, so you actually, you actually act like a, an auctioneer. Ooh. Auctioneer. Yes. Do I hear 200? Do I hear 200? Going once, going twice, going three times, sold. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> for 200 pounds or dollars or whatever mm. uh, for group B. You keep track of which team bought with each sentence and for how much. And at the end, you go over the list by asking each group, the group that bought the sentence, to correct it or say it's already correct. And the winning group is the group that has the biggest number of correct sentences, mm -hmm. either because they were right to begin with or because they have fixed it. Or if there is a tie, then the winning group is the one with most money left over. Excellent, yeah. Brilliant. I like this. It sounds great because it appeals to the competitive instincts of students. And I think <laughs> yeah. we all agree that we've had lots of students who uh, are deeply competitive. It also helps them realize that they can uh, already self-correct. 
and they realize you're paying attention. Oh, oh, this was my sentence, <laughs> and and now I know how to correct it. But I, I suppose you don't put their name on it. It doesn't have their name next to the mistake. Of course not. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, especially if it's a, one with a mistake. And, and sometimes I change. For example, if they say I'm from Rio de Janeiro and I only have one person there, uh, I change the city. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that they know the mistake, but not who said it. Yeah. Yeah. So have any of you guys done this in the classroom? No. An no, auction? No. I think I might have a, a while back, and I think yeah. I remember it getting a bit rowdy. Yeah, yeah. Which was fun. Lots I've, of fun. I've definitely done it. I, I mm. took in um, some Monopoly money so they could actually mm. bid with, <laughs> with real money, mainly because I'm very bad at math, so I couldn't uh, remember who'd bid on what. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, it does get very, very rowdy, which I personally quite like in a classroom. It's a very good um, sort of Friday activity, like you say, for the end of the week to kind of draw together the mistakes or, you know, cover the grammar that you've been looking at that week. I think that's a really good thing to do. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Natai. Thank you. Now it's time for Word of the Month. Each month we discuss a piece of ELT jargon and how it affects teachers. So, Patrick, what's the skinny on contrastive analysis? Right. Contrastive analysis is basically the systematic study of a pair of languages in order to identify similarities and differences between them and L1. This is done with a view to highlighting possible difficulties for language learners. So the mother tongue is contrasted with the language they are learning and it incorporates various features of the language such as morphology, phonology, lexicography and so on. And the idea is that by studying both the L1 and L2, learners and teachers will be able to anticipate typical errors that will occur. Hmm. Make sense? It does, yeah. Good. So this theory was formulated way back in the 50s and 60s by Robert Lardo, who posited that if languages contain similar elements, they would make language learning simpler. And conversely, the more different the languages, the greater the degree of difficulty students would have in learning them. The expectation was that once the areas of potential difficulty had been identified, language courses could then be designed more efficiently. Uh, however, this theory actually came in for a lot of criticism in the 70s when it was claimed that all learner errors in L2 could be attributed to L1 interference, and this was widely debunked, critics pointing out that many of the errors predicted by contrastive analysis were actually not occurring, and even more strangely, certain errors were made uniformly by all language learners, irrespective of their L1. But what became clear was that contrastive analysis could not necessarily predict errors. However, it was very useful in retrospective explanation of errors. Right. And a more recent iteration of contrastive analysis contradicts the original theory, stating that the more different the L2 is from the L1, the easier it should be for the learner to acquire the target language mm -hmm. because the similarities in languages actually create confusion. But anyway, um, how does this relate to what uh, we're doing on the pod? What I wanted to talk about was how much attention should be given when planning classes to L1 interference. I, I thought we could maybe rule out multilingual classes when planning because you're not going to um, you're not going to trust 16 different languages. Um, but with monolingual classes, and Natalia, I'm going to talk to you about this. How aware should teachers be of things like false friends and grammatical differences between uh, their students L1, for in your case Portuguese, and English? Well, if they know the language, it's a great resource to tap into. Because you can, like you said, anticipate errors and work on them and even exemplify with the things that are similar or different from the language. So you know when you're teaching, for example, what I said before, there is and there are, mm -hmm. you know that your students will come up with the verb have mm -hmm. because that's the direct translation uh, to present in Portuguese. Right, yeah. So, yeah. so you need to show that if you want to use the word have, you need the subject there. So that's important, I believe. I mean, I think we're talking about quite broad brushstrokes here. So there are certain like pronunciation issues, for example. I think in Portuguese it would be an R and an H sound are quite commonly mixed up or cause problems. So things you know will occur. Is that correct? Yes, uh, because we pronounce the... When we see a, an R spelled, we pronounce it with an, with an H sound. Mm. So, yeah, so we've got these kind of broad brushstrokes. But obviously... The, Individual students will will have individual errors as well, uh, probably at a higher level, I should imagine. Mm -hmm. So well, I think that's why course design doesn't really work for complete languages. You can only predict a certain amount of errors. Sam, have you ever had any, in planning stages, in previous pods you said you spoke French. Did you ever teach French students and look at the language beforehand? No, I mean, um, so I only ever taught French students in a um, multilingual class. Uh, so definitely any time I could help them one-on-one -on -one if they were struggling with the meaning of a word or 
Yeah, they were making an error that I thought was caused because of interference from their, their L1, then I would try and help them. The only experience I've had of monolingual classes was I used to teach in Vietnam. And really, my understanding of Vietnamese is, is nowhere near good enough to, to help me do this with them. So I, I just focused on English. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think similar in Japan. And also what Natalia was saying in that once you start learning the language yourself, then you can become more aware of it. But it can trap you as well. Right. But I think when you go, a lot of us, you know, go to another country for the experience as well as for the teaching. And so I think you'd want to kind of inform yourself on that language and the things that can come up uh, mm. that are particular to that language. So, you know, read up on things. I think that's what you do anyway, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think for a teacher and by extension for a student, being aware of common pitfalls is mm. obviously very useful. But Sam, Becker and myself, we're all talking from the uh, perspective of, I mean, we're native speakers, but Mm. obviously a lot of teachers are are non-native and are also uh, even bilingual like yourself. Um, So Natalia, from your point of view with bilingual teaching, does this have more impact? Uh, Yes, because we know the language uh, deeply and and we can help them through the same process we've gone through. Um, We've learned English and we know where the main uh, pitfalls are. So I believe we can help our students with that. It's probably easier from, from for, for you then to, to address those pitfalls. To predict what to might predict come them up. Mm. Because you've, yeah, as you say, you've gone through it yourself. Yes, uh, the ones I know are there, of course, yeah. because they're yeah. pitfalls I still, <laughs> I still find myself <laughs> <laughs> falling into. I suppose, of course, uh, there are always unexpected errors which will come up. But as a, as a general rule, having learned a language yourself, you can see more easily uh, what errors your, your learners may encounter. Yeah, definitely. Great. All right. Thanks very much. Um, now let's move on to the interview. This month, Patrick is talking to Adrian Underhill about comfortable intelligibility, world Englishes and improv in the classroom. Hi, Adrian. Hi, how are you? Oh, good, thanks, uh, Patrick. Nice to be here and uh, looking forward to our little conversation now. Top notch. Excellent. So thanks very much for taking the time to come on the show. Um, I'm going to kick things off with this question. How important do you think it is for learners to aim for a native speaker accent or should they be encouraged to retain their original accent? Good question. I think both are possible. But I think what's even more important is that teacher and student aim for comfortable intelligibility, Mm -hmm. both when speaking and when listening. I think that these days is really the aim of pronunciation work in the area of global English or global Englishes. Mm -hmm. So I would propose that that is the most important thing. And I think that if one chooses a good method and the method for pronunciation that I propose reconnects learners with their pronunciation muscles so that they can Uh, so to speak, escape the grip of their mother tongue pronunciation. And and once they're in that kind of zone, the learner does actually have options to head towards a certain model, whether it's native speaker or, or, uh, you know, uh, movie star or or, or singer or or local hero Mm -hmm. or friends, or retain their own accent and uh, head for, uh, you know, another kind of zone. All of these are possible, but I think intelligibility is the new correctness rather than some... Uh, older form of, of, of precise correctness matching a certain esteemed model. I think esteemed models are, are, are fading out. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, recently on the podcast, we have been discussing native speakerism. And in your opinion, how is teaching pronunciation different for non-native teachers? Well, first, I should say, yeah, it's a good question. I, I would say that every teacher should teach their own accent native or non-native, right. and expose their students to multiple other accents. So uh, people really are getting exposed to global Englishes, mm-hmm. um, including those of their teachers. I think that the non-native teacher is uh, very useful because they are probably inquiring into their own pronunciation. And to be a teacher who is inquiring into their own pronunciation will be of great help to their students. The native teacher, too, needs to be inquiring into how they speak and how they pronounce and finding in their own mouths the the sounds that their learners are making in order to be able to help them. Okay. What would be some good ways of uh, exposing students to uh, other accents, other Englishes? Well, first of all, in some cases, you can say, look, listen to the other teachers in this school. They speak. Some of them speak different ways. Listen to them carefully and try to have conversations with them. 
uh, but especially, of course, uh, go online, where we can be exposed to so many different uh, accents, whether they are websites which actually specialize in accents, but I'm not particularly thinking of those. I'm just thinking of those accents that you will meet simply through uh, your normal work cruising about on the web. Mm, okay. Um, I, I, I should just say that uh, I think in the end, native and non-native teachers are in the same boat because they have the same problem. Neither of them, by and large, and I, some people would disagree with me, neither of them really know from the inside what they're doing in their mouths. They may know it cognitively, they've read books and done certain kinds of courses, but that's not the point. They need to know it from the inside to actually feel what they're doing with different sounds and different bits of connected speech. Because if they could really feel from inside what they're doing, they could help their students. But teachers, by and large, don't have that inside sense of what they're doing. It's not very difficult to develop. It's very easy to develop. But mm. our teacher training doesn't do that. OK, so, so what tips could you give for teachers who do find teaching pronunciation challenging? Well, there's one simple way out, which is to get into your own mouth and feel what's going on mm. with the different sounds and the, and the sounds connected into words and word stress and the words connected into connected speech. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do in my intensive courses, and I believe that there are probably other ways that you can do that. Certainly you can go uh, online and get an idea of this from the Macmillan series of videos that, that, that I've made, mm -hmm. uh, which are available through, on YouTube, and I believe through One Stop. Mm, absolutely, um, yeah. <clears throat> so that's one approach. OK. Um, well, let's move on. I want to talk a little bit about conferences. And as a former president of IATEFL, what would be your advice for teachers going to conferences or, for example, wanting to present at conferences? Well, I think conference fatigue is, is a problem and there's so much going on. It is important to um, focus on what really interests you mm -hmm. and don't just fill your head with what people say, but look for your own curiosity and what really fires you up so that you follow your own, uh, your own interest and feed your own interests at the same time. Mm -hmm. Being selective, so to speak. Be very selective. And, you know, people in conferences take it all very seriously. But it's just a show. Playfulness is the issue. And, uh, you know, we should enjoy the, the playfulness of, of learning, I think. It, are you talking also about people who are speaking at conferences? Well, if, if teachers want to present, yeah. Um, so their first time presenter, for example. Well, one thing I notice, uh, not just in the first time presenters, is that people take 15 of their 30 minutes uh, sort of by way of introduction and don't get into the meat of what they want to say until the last 10 minutes. Right. So I always say to people, start halfway through, just get into it. Mm. Yeah, so get, get rid of the preamble and the waffle yeah, and go yeah. straight for the point, yeah. Yeah, maybe give it one sentence, but then get straight to the point. Excellent advice. It's Great. nervousness, I think, which holds people back. I think you could be right, absolutely. Um, but conferences and, and also qualifications can be quite expensive and a lot of teachers are not in a position to be able to attend them. So how could they make more out of their professional development if they're not able to go to a conference? Well, uh, nowadays, I think we're all in a very good um, position regarding that because we can join online. You don't need to attend an IATEFL conference in person. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on online, especially through the special interest groups. Engage with them, uh, work with them, write for them. You can do that all from your own place in the world, wherever that is. Um, but also, I think that we can develop our own little learning communities around ourselves, you know, uh, depending on what we're interested in, um, talk to teachers around us. And, uh, uh, you know, even if it's just a, a learning community of two, mm. uh, uh, discuss what you're doing and experiment together and gradually other people will perhaps join you. Yeah, I think maybe maybe kind of peer observations and... Um, kind peer of, observations, a very good idea, yes. yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing may be a little bit left by the wayside. Sometimes people look for a bigger, kind of more active solution and then there's something on your doorstep, so... Exactly. OK, well, yeah, we do, we do look a lot of professional development on the podcast. And uh, I saw an interview with uh, IATFL Issues magazine, and which you did. And you said that teacher development is uh, the process of becoming the best teacher one is able to be, and a process, this process that can be started but never finished. So how do you ensure that your teaching and indeed your teacher training stays fresh? Well, I have a little mantra, which is like, see what's going on, uh, do something different and learn from it. Mm. And uh, so whatever's happening in a class or in a training room, you know, try to really see from different perspectives and different points of view what's happening without judging it. Just see what's going on from different angles, different versions of what's happening, and then try doing something different, not to improve it 
or for the hell of it, but because when you do something different, you learn even more about what's going on and then learn from it. Okay. So yeah. uh, and I, I think that I regard that as a kind of playfulness, a kind of uh, you know, useful uh, playfulness. Uh, yeah, so keeping a lightness to the approach, so not yeah, kind of... Yeah, getting... exercise of, of curiosity, a way of actively being curious. Excellent. Um, so you, you've been in ELT for, for uh, four decades now, I think, um, and there's been lots of changes in that, in that time. Yeah, that's right, there have. Yeah, and what, so what do you see as the future of teaching? Is there going to be kind of robots or apps and everything taking over? Well, I think probably uh, quite a bit of bad teaching could well be replaced by robots and apps, and that might be useful if it, if it was. But um, technology will, of course, provide further extraordinary resources and, and amazing access and facilities it won't be able to replace what good teaching provides, which is making meaning, making genuine interaction, uh, providing real uh, feedback, and above all, creating relationship, which is the, the area in which, out of which language comes, mm. making and, mm. and feeding relationship. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, creating a rapport with the students. Rapport, meaning, relationship. Yeah, exactly. Very, very important. Um, but I think that, unfortunately, all teachers aren't good at this, and that's not necessarily their fault. It's because, in my view, our methodology doesn't really deal with it. Yeah, is that to do with addressing classroom, classroom management, student motivation and engagement? Well, classroom management, I think, is very much part of... It is, yeah, but cl when you consider classroom management, it is the mainstream of our methodology. But I, I'm talking about something beyond classroom management, which is relationship, in mm. the class, facilitation rather than teaching. Yeah, you know, um, it, it's the factor X that Earl Stevick used to talk about. You know, it's something that is uh, bigger and deeper than any methodology. Yeah, and per perhaps that's something that comes just through experience. It's not something that you can put on an, an initial teacher training. To a certain extent, I don't know if you can train it, but it is possible for anyone to become uh, a better listener. It's possible for anyone to become um, more empathic and to understand more of what's happening in their class and to make more use of the energy there, of the spontaneity of what happens in class. Mm -hmm. okay. um, to be better at departing from there usefully, from their lesson plan, and then getting back to it. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, sure. Um, speaking of spontaneity, you're, you're, a, you're a jazz musician, and you, so you like a bit of improvisation. How much of a role do you think improvisation plays in the language classroom? Well... It plays a big role for everyone because we're all at it all of the time. We plan a lesson, but we don't know what's going to happen. And then we go into the lesson. Mm. And if you're sort of not comfortable with improvising, you, you sort of bash the lesson back into the shape of your lesson plan. But in so doing, you miss most of the energy that could be converted into learning. On the other hand, a lot of teachers are able to uh, depart from the lesson plan to engage with the energy of the moment and then to get back onto the plan, mm. which I think is a very useful thing. But I think our methodology does not really see improvisation. Improvisation is not really on its radar screen. No. It doesn't figure anywhere, uh, you know, in any of the categories of competence. And it needs to be addressed head on because it is what happens most of the time. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I suppose coming back to something we mentioned earlier, that could be to do with peer observation. If you, if you see a, a colleague who's very good at kind of addressing uh, issues that come up in class, you can then take that away and use that in your own practice. Yes, and uh, of course you can. And what needs to happen is that people talk about improvisation mm. um, and they, it, there becomes a discourse of it so that we can then get better at it um, and... Uh, you know, critique our own capacity to make use of what happens, to make use of the offers that come all around. Every, every student response is an opportunity for something slightly off the lesson plan. Yeah. How do we use that? Yeah, excellent question. So um, finally, I want to ask you one more question. Yeah. And uh, so if, if you could make one significant change to the world of ELT as it currently stands, what would that change be? Well... Uh, one thing that comes to mind would be that you're talking about ma waving a magic wand, are you? I am, yes. Okay. Well, I, I'd quite like to wave a magic wand, which created a methodology which was better at examining itself and critiquing itself than the one we have. Right. One which is sort of paradoxically really searching out its own blind spots mm. uh, and that has a built-in alarm that goes off when it gets too 
distanced from what's really going on in learning in the yeah. classroom. Okay. Um, a self-governing methodology. Yeah, I would like it to deal more with relationship, uh, more with inquiry, more with uh, reflective practice, uh, more with the drama of learning. Hmm. Learning as drama, drama as learning. Excellent. Brilliant. That's a great answer. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been, it's been really fascinating. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be uh, on uh, this uh, Macmillan show. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to propose to people that they uh, might like to tune in to uh, One Stop amongst many other aspects of uh, what Macmillan offers. Yeah, thanks very much. And in, in, enjoy IATFL and beyond. And good, good luck for, for the rest of 2017. Marvellous. Thank Take you so much, Cheers, Adrian. Okay, so um, as Adrian briefly mentioned SIGs, I thought it might be a good opportunity to give a bit more information about what they are and uh, how you can get involved. So special interest groups, or SIGs, essentially help teachers develop specialisms in key areas of ELT. Each group offers dedicated forums and newsletters, as well as a program of training events, workshops and conferences around the world. Currently, there are 16 special interest groups to choose from. Things like teacher development, young learners and teenagers, English for specific purposes. So there's lots Mm. and lots of um, different areas for you to get involved in. Now, to join a SIG, you have to be a member of IATEFL, although non-members can go to SIG events. Uh, so if you want any more information about special interest groups, um, please visit the IATEFL website. OK, next up, it's Teacher's Dilemma. Each month we describe a common classroom issue and ask our listeners to send in their solutions. So, Becca, what's this month's problem? So, you have prepped a lesson for your class of 12 It's a great lesson which requires the students first to work in pairs, then groups of four, and finally two groups of six. It's going to be brilliant and you're really looking forward to it until the moment you walk into the classroom and you realise you only have two students in your class today. It's a numerical disaster, Natalia. What do you do? Well, cry internally and... (laughs) (laughs) Of course, of course, there's always crying. But you have a chance to work on their individual needs and you can do test repetition some some other way, asking them to do uh, in a pair, mm-hmm. and then doing it with you and play devil's advocate maybe, or imagining they're presenting to a boss or yeah. a different context, different registers. Yeah, I think you, you're sort of seeing it as an opportunity rather than That's as a disaster. Yeah, yeah. And I think in early teaching days, you're a bit scared by that. You're a bit thrown and you had it all planned and what do you do? But yeah, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to work with those two students directly, isn't it? Okay, listeners, over to you. What do you do when your class is smaller than expected? Send your solutions to onestoppodcast at springernature.com. All right, it's Q&A time on the One Stop Podcast, the part of the show in which we try to answer your questions. Okay, our first question this month comes from Sonia in Brazil, who asks, what are the essential elements I need to include in a lesson plan? How can it be less time consuming? Natalia, what do you think? Well, if, if it's not an official lesson plan that you're going to be assessed on, I would say the steps with the time and the page will be on and a to-do list before you enter into the classroom. Should I cut out some sets or Xerox some material, like some uh, handouts? And that's it, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good point, is that if, if, as you say, it's not being uh, officially assessed, it's for you. So you need to make something that works for you and for that particular class. But I do think it depends on the type of class that you're teaching. I think my lesson plans for um, young learners were very, very different to the exam classes that I taught, for example. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And coming back to the uh, the assessed nature of it, I, I remember on my diploma doing lesson plans which were eight, nine pages mm, long because wow. you had to have you had to have analysis of each learner's strengths and weaknesses mm-hmm. in the lesson plan. I don't think that's necessarily reasonable to expect every teacher, every class to assess their learner's difficulties. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe then, like as you say, a clear idea of timings or a sort of basic understanding of what kind of timings you're aiming for. Answers would be really, really helpful, I think, to, to things that you're trying to do. And also any kind of pitfalls, really, anything that in the class that might trip students up. So anticipating those kind of errors, I think, is a good idea. 
Okay, our next question comes from Juliana in Brazil. Juliana asks, how can we help shy students speak more confidently, even if they don't have a large vocabulary? So, Natalia, what do you think? Um, how can you help shy students speak more confidently? Well, making sure, I'd, I'd say, first and foremost, that the tasks are achievable at their level. Absolutely, yeah. So nothing um, intimidating or things that they can't do. Yeah, re um, reduce the pressure or right. have no pressure, ideally. Or another idea is, you know, you put your students in pairs. Well, think about who they're sitting next to, who are they paired up with. Sometimes you can get really good combinations if you know your students well. Yeah, true. And that can help that uh, more shy student. And I think personalisation is good as well. So if you know a student's interested in a particular topic, make sure you address that topic so they can talk about something they, they have knowledge of and are interested in. Mm. Agreed, yeah. And actually, I think that segues quite nicely into our mm. final question this month, which is, what are some quick, surefire ways of increasing student motivation? Mm. So I think one obvious way to do that is to personalise the material, to make it relevant to your students. Because if you're teaching something that is not interesting to them, then it's not very motivational. Yeah, or something from today's news. If you can, if you can whip something up quite quickly, then that's always quite fun. Absolutely. Any ideas, Natalia? And, and accountability, too. If you show them that they're learning uh, or elicit, what have you learned today, the, they'll, they'll see that they're making progress and mm. uh, that they can uh, succeed even more. Yeah. Okay. So having like learner profiles to show at the end of a week um, what they've learned. So maybe I mean, it could be something like test scores. And then at the end of the month, you could see how they've improved on certain, uh, certain areas of their English. Or even every every lesson, something snappy like yeah. three words you've learned today. What do you know now that you didn't know at, at the beginning of the class? And I think uh, if all else fails, you can always go for cash prizes. <laughs> Primary. <laughs> <laughs> As if we had any. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> OK, well, that's it for another month. We've got to go, I'm afraid. Um, if you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, please email us at onestoppodcast at springernature.com or leave a comment on the One Stop page. Thanks to our regular panellists, Patrick and Becca. Thank you. Cheers, Sam. A big thanks to our guest teacher, Natalia Guerrero, for getting up so early to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And until next month, this is the One Stop English Podcast.